Right. Our final speaker before we come to the questions is Dr. Rory O'Connell, who has been a member of the Queen's University Belfast School of Law uh, Human Rights Centre since uh, 2001. And he's going to talk on something which is of great interest to all of us uh, um, in the uh, this month and particularly early next month. Uh, Rory was part of the team overseeing the budget analysis project at Queen's University, who developed a framework for budget analysis in Northern Ireland, part of the emerging international work in using monitoring of government's budgetary systems and resource allocation and expenditure to measure the extent to which they are meeting their human rights obligations. Rory, you're very welcome. Uh, I'll briefly introduce the project with which I was involved and say a bit about the framework that we developed uh, in that project, talk about some of the budget analysis tools uh, that we identified in the course of that project, say a little bit about our experience and findings with particular case studies, and conclude with some opportunities and challenges that is raised by budget work or budget analysis work. Budget work or budget analysis work is actually, in one sense, it's somewhat new. Uh, one expert says this is something that's really only emerged of the last 10 years. It's not actually that new. Uh, if you think about it, one of the predecessors of the modern human rights movement, uh, the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen in 1789, grew out of a revolution that was itself triggered by a fiscal crisis and problems of socioeconomic deprivation. And in that Declaration of Rights of Man and of the Citizen, you actually find references to taxation and the principle of contributing to uh, the public coffers according to principles of equality uh, and ability. And you find principles in there about representation and the monitoring of government expenditure. So in one sense, this is something that goes back to the origins of the human rights movement. Uh, Again, you find it, anyone want to take another look at it, in Tom Paine's The Rights of Man, written in the 1790s. The last third of the book is taken up with, uh, effectively, budget analysis. But so, uh, a few years ago, Queen's University got a, some funding to look at how we could uh, develop budget analysis principles, and in particular, apply it to the cause of the advancement of economic and social rights in Northern Ireland. We were a bit optimistic, I think, when talking about advancement. Uh, since we got the project, the issue often seems to be more one of firefighting against retrogressive measures than advancing uh, human rights. And sometimes I think uh, I am now a slightly more pessimistic than when we started the project. The project involved myself, uh, Professor Colin Harvey at Queen's, and also Professor Aoife Nolan, who's speaking in the other parallel session uh, today. And as part of that project, we produced a number of documents, all of which are available on the Queen's website. These include a review of existing practice and guidance uh, that I'll refer more to in a few minutes. Also, a fairly detailed analysis of the relevant human rights standards and how they applied uh, to budget work and a number of case studies are trying to apply this framework to particular issues surrounding social housing and mental health provision in Northern Ireland. So those resources are all available uh, on the Queen's website for anyone who wants to take a closer look at them. Just a couple of other preliminary comments when thinking about budget work. There are different ways of approaching it. Um, you can approach it in a sense in a bottom-up manner or a top-down approach. So a top-down approach looking at high-level policies and budget figures and seeing what those actually mean in practice. There is, and that's basically the approach that the Queen's project took. But it is important, I think, to highlight that there are other ways of doing this. Uh, and in particular, it is perfectly possible to start very much on the ground. Uh, and try and look at very specific problems. And this, for instance, is the approach taken uh, by another Northern Ireland-based uh, initiative, the Pr Participation and Practice of Rights Group uh, in Northern Ireland. And they've done s some very good work uh, looking at very specific issues in a very participatory-oriented fashion and trying to figure out what are the financial problems uh, that underpin real-life problems facing their uh, particular stakeholders. Another preliminary comment, uh, which I suppose is important, 
is that we were focusing on Northern Ireland as a devolved province within the United Kingdom. And there are particular difficulties raised in relation to devolved provinces or federal states, in particular because Northern Ireland has very limited uh, financial competences. Uh, the bulk of its income uh, depends on a block grant from the UK government, and the Northern Ireland Parliament, our Assembly, for instance, does not have the power that was originally granted, say, to Scotland in 1998 to vary the income tax rate. We don't have any uh, financial competence uh, of that nature. Uh, though there are still discussions, which I think haven't quite concluded, on whether or not we will get powers to vary corporation tax rates. Uh, but that's uh, an important preliminary point because budget work, budget analysis can cover a whole range of topics. Uh, it can cover, for instance, how governments go about managing the entire economic system. Uh, it can look at how Governments raise resources, uh, and we've heard a bit about this already this morning. Uh, to some extent, we could not look at these issues in very much detail in the context of Northern Ireland because the Northern Ireland Executive and Assembly doesn't have the appropriate levers to actually engage in that sort of activity. So that instead, our focus was much more on questions of how uh, the executive allocated uh, funds to particular priorities, how it expended them, uh, processes of participation, consultation around how these funds were expended, rather than the more big picture questions that are uh, more obviously relevant, say, at the level of the United Kingdom, or for that matter, the Republic of Ireland. The framework that we adopted was based on the International Covenant of Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, our ICESCR. And as I say, we have a document that goes through the obligations in ICESCR in some detail and explains how they apply uh, to budgetary decisions. That choice of a framework was, again, dictated a bit by where we were based and the legal resources available to us. Uh, the United Kingdom has the Human Rights Act that has been mentioned, I think, earlier, but this incorporates rights in the European Convention on Human Rights, which for the most part do not include social and economic rights. So we could not look to, particularly to a domestic Bill of Rights uh, for appropriate standards. Uh, the United Kingdom has only ratified the original European Social Charter uh, that we've had reference to already, and we'll hear more about this afternoon. And in particular, the United Kingdom has not ratified the revised European Social Charter and, crucially, has not accepted the collective complaints mechanism under the European Social Charter. So all of these factors inclined us to look towards ICESCR, but in addition, there's a positive reason, which is uh, that there is quite a lot of guidance from the ICESCR committee uh, and commentators on the ICESCO principles as to the content and the obligations of the rights in ICESCO. So there's a very positive uh, reason for looking to ICESCO. But of course, in other contexts, it may be more useful for people in a different jurisdiction to look to their own national constitutional framework or to look uh, to the European Social Charter. And of course, Ireland, for instance, does accept collective complaints under the European Social Charter. The obligations in ICESCR, uh, when people originally are first look at the obligations in Article 2 of ICESCR, when you read the obligations on governments, uh, the initial reaction is that it contains a whole set of escape clauses, or wiggle room for governments to avoid actually implementing any obligations. But over the last 20, 25 years, it's become clear that despite fairly qualified language in ICESCR, uh, there are legal obligations, and some of them are immediate legal obligations. Again, I suppose when you, if you look at our document, you'll see that we started off by talking about the progressive obligations, the obligations to work towards the full realization of all the ICESCR rights for everyone. And I think that still reflects a bit our optimism at the time when we started the project. Looking at it now, I 
feel it important to stress what are the immediate obligations uh, rather than uh, the ones that we are working towards in the future without actually forgetting them. And the minimum, ob or sorry, the immediate obligations under ISESCR are immediate obligations to respect the minimum core, uh, the essential elements of each rights that are uh, relevant, in some cases relevant even to basic survival. Right? So we have uh, a right to housing, which includes rights to adequate housing. But in addition, within that, there are certain basic minimum elements of the right to housing, such as shelter and sanitation. And you can do this process uh, in relation to other ICESCA rights as well. And the ICESCA committee tells us that these minimum core obligations must be implemented. Right? And that states must be able to show if they're not implementing them that they have used all of the resources at their disposal, including if necessary appealing for international aid in order to implement these minimum core obligations. In one or two places, ISESCR committee even describes these obligations as non-derogable, uh, which is a technical term meaning that not even a state of war or a natural disaster excuses failure to implement these obligations. The other immediate obligations, there's an immediate obligation not to take deliberate backward steps in the enjoyment of ISESCA rights. Uh, and if you want to take backward steps in the enjoyment of ISESCA rights, then as we've already heard this morning, there is a duty to justify such steps, uh, including by reference to the resources that are available. Right? So importantly, backward steps, even deliberate backward steps, are not always and automatically prohibited, but there is a strong onus on governments to actually demonstrate that this is necessary and that other options besides rowing backwards on the enjoyment of socioeconomic rights have been explored. Crucially, there is an immediate obligation of non-discrimination. So whatever steps are taken must not discriminate. And ISESCR understands discrimination and non-discrimination both in the sense of direct discrimination, uh, so targeting particular disfavored groups would be ruled out, uh, but also indirect discrimination is prohibited under uh, ISESCR standards. So even measures, uh, and it's very easy to imagine these, which look as if they hurt everyone equally, but actually fall disproportionately much more severely on particular groups, uh, be these women, people with disabilities, uh, ethnic minorities, asylum seekers, migrants, children. Uh, such measures are again prohibited subject to the possibility of showing that there is justification for them. And there are also some important procedural obligations which the ISESCR committee says are immediate uh, and not subject to resources. So states, for instance, must have plans in place in order to uh, move towards the full realization of ISESCR rights. And these procedural obligations also include obligations surrounding participation. But I don't want us to forget about uh, the progressive obligations either. Uh, there is an obligation to progressively realize all the rights in ISESCA. Uh, and this is within the context of maximum available resources. Uh, and that language sometimes uh, is indicative of what people might call wiggle room, uh, but is actually does impose obligations. Progressive realization implies, first of all, there must not be retrogression which we've already mentioned, but also that you must be able to show you are moving forward. And all of this is within the context of maximum available resources. Again, that may sound like a get-out clause for governments, uh, but it does direct you to the question of whether or not governments are actually raising sufficient resources and how they are prioritizing those resources. Are resources being prioritized towards the realization of socioeconomic rights uh, rather than other projects not related to the realization of human rights? As part of the project, we reviewed existing good practice and guidance on budget work and social and economic rights. And you can read through the more detailed analysis of 14 different examples on the website. Uh, 
A couple of perhaps that I'll single out that are especially useful, I would suggest, is the work of uh, the Center for Economic and Social Rights, uh, of which Ignacio Saez is the director. Uh, and we've heard from Ignacio this morning. And I would also identify the International Human Rights Internship Program in Washington, D.C., which is in particular under uh, uh, or with work from Anne Bleiberg trying to are explaining how budget work applies in practical terms. Right? And they produce some very useful um, user-friendly st steps on how to apply budget analysis to the realization of human rights. But a few of the uh, tools that we covered in our review of selected guidance and good practice uh, was first of all, at a very basic level, identifying particular budget allocations and what they are being used for, and trying to identify whether they are being used in a way which is involved in the realization of human rights, and in particular social and economic rights. Does it have a neutral effect? Are does it indeed have an inimical effect on the realization of social and economic rights? Uh, one of the case studies, for instance, gave the example of subsidies for the tobacco industry as being something that is actually expenditure presumably harmful to the realization of social and economic rights. That's only a first step, of course. Uh, where that becomes more useful is where you can then look to see where particular departments or programs have either underspent or overspent on their budget, right? or where resources have been diverted away from the allocated purpose, or where there's been inefficiency in the use of allocations. And all of this goes back to this idea that maximum available resources is actually an obligation. Yeah? It isn't just meaningless, uh, a meaningless phrase or a get-out clause for governments. If a particular project has been allocated resources for the realization of social and economic rights and has not actually expended all of its resources. Yeah, it's tried to make savings and handed those savings back to the exchequer, or it's diverted those uh, resources towards some other purpose. The maximum of available resources have not actually been used, where they've actually been allocated and simply not used are diverted. Are where Projects which aren't, uh, which are neutral or even inimical to the realization of socioeconomic rights actually overspend. That is money that has to be taken from somewhere else. Uh, and that is, again, arguably a failure to devote the available resources towards the realization of social and economic rights. Another frequently used tool in the guidance and good practice was to analyze how uh, allocations or expenditures change over time. And this is especially important for the idea of progressive realization, in that it may give an indication that there is progressive realization of rights, rights are being more uh, effectively realized over time, or that there, conversely, is a problem of retrogression, if there seems to be a decrease in allocations or expenditure. There are a few uh, very important caveats to add when saying this. I think uh, they were already alluded to this morning, indeed. Uh, important caveats, you do need to take on board things like the need to adjust for inflation, for instance, when looking at such figures. You probably also need to consider the need to look at making adjustments for uh, demography. Yeah. If uh, the population has significantly increased but spending has stayed the same, that actually implies that per capita spending has gone down, even though the absolute or global terms may not have gone down. So you need to allow for population changes, you need to allow for inflation. You also need to bear in mind that these figures are necessarily only a proxy measure. Uh, for what we're really interested in, which is whether or not human rights are being better realized on the ground. It may be the case that uh, more money is being allocated, but it is being spent inefficiently, uh, and so there isn't really progressive realization on the ground. Or I suppose in happier circumstances, there may be less money, but it's being spent so much more efficiently, there is actually an improvement on the ground. So there is uh, a need to bear in mind that this can only be a proxy measure, but it is an important uh, 
possible warning that there is a problem with retrogression, it is helpful in trying to see, is there actual progressive realization? Another tool is to look at the expend the allocation or the expenditure for particular, well, for economic and social rights generally, or particular economic and social rights as a percentage either of the government's budget or total expenditure, or indeed as a percentage of gross domestic product. Uh, and again, look at this over time. Yeah, uh, If we find that particular budgets for the realization of human rights are as a percentage of the budget shrinking over time, uh, but other expenditures uh, devoted to areas like defense or foreign affairs or tourism, which may not be so directly uh, involved in the realization of social and economic rights or human rights, are increasing. That suggests that maybe the maximum available resources aren't being directed towards the realization of human rights. Or if uh, the resources being allocated and expended on particular economic and social rights appear relatively stable or even modestly increasing, but this is in the context, again, in uh, happier days of a rapidly increasing gross domestic product, that suggests that actually resources are available uh, if a country is richer that aren't being used. So again, there is a possible failure uh, to devote maximum available resources to realizing economic and social rights. And it's also possible to do this, and Ignacio showed some nice graphs this morning of country comparisons to see how, uh, what percentage of their budget or what percentage of GDP particular countries are spending on the realization of economic and social rights. Yeah. Uh, the Center for Economic and Social Rights, Ignacio's outfit has done some very nice work on this in relation to Guatemala, for instance. Another possibility is to rely on uh, benchmarks in order to see whether or not the resources being devoted on a per capita basis to realize particular rights match up to benchmarks set either by international organizations or uh, indeed national benchmarks. Do the resources that are allocated through the social security and social welfare systems, for instance, provide people with uh, enough income to meet or surpass the poverty levels uh, in particular countries? Or does a country actually meet the World Health Organization recommendation of allocating 5% of GDP towards health? Also useful, and again going back to the notion of the need to take steps to realize human rights, is to look to see how government allocation and expenditure matches against government's own uh, identified need. Right? What, is the, what does government identify as what needs to be done in order to realize uh, particular economic and social rights? And are the resources allocated actually sufficient to meet that? Though we didn't really look at this in relation to Northern Ireland because of the particular competences of the Northern Ireland Assembly and Executive, uh, Re revenue is uh, an issue that we've heard about already this morning. Uh, if a country, for instance, is relying heavily on indirect taxation uh, rather than direct taxation, that may impact much more heavily on vulnerable groups and the less well-off. Uh, or you can, of course, look at how particular countries, again, gather their revenue and do cross-country comparisons, such as the example Ignacio gave this morning. Uh, in Northern Ireland, we have had this debate about devolving corporation tax powers, yes, for quite some time. And no politician has actually come out and said that we ought to increase corporation tax in Northern Ireland in order to increase the number of rev uh, the revenue. Uh, not a single politician, apart from maybe a few fringe uh, parties, has made such a suggestion. The consensus among politicians is that uh, the revenues available to Northern Ireland should actually be reduced by lowering corporation tax if we get these powers. Uh, of course, that's uh, on the assumption that this will stimulate growth in the economy. Uh, finally, and, and by no means least, uh, it's important to look to see who actually benefits from uh, government budgetary decisions. And there are many examples of institutions that do this sort of work. 
one of the best known in the United Kingdom is the Institute for Fiscal Studies, for instance, in London, uh, which after the 2010 Conservative Liberal Democratic government uh, budget uh, analyzed how the combination of taxation changes and public spending changes would impact upon people in uh, the different income deciles in the country, and in particular how it would impact on people depending on whether or not they had uh, dependent children. Um, that indicated that the budget was rather, especially when you look at uh, families with children, rather starkly regressive in its impact. But again, that's a top-down approach. It is perfectly possible, and organizations like IDASA in South Africa uh, also have used more uh, participatory models of asking people on the ground how they experience poverty, how they experience poverty relief uh, mechanisms, and so on. So there are different ways of doing this. Sorry, Emily, how am I doing for time? It's about two minutes left. Oh, okay. I will then... <laughs> Just very quickly say that budget analysis work, it seems to me, offers some uh, important uh, opportunities. It emphasizes that if we want, if we're serious about rights, we have to spend money on them. I think it highlights very much the important indivisibility of human rights that, again, we've already heard from several speakers. Uh, realizing social and economic rights in a budget analysis framework, for instance, also requires that you consider issues like uh, freedom of information which is perhaps more of a civil and political right, uh, and that is being the most obvious, but by no means the only example. Budget analysis work is also important as offering an alternative uh, to very important litigation-oriented strategies that Michael was talking about. Offers interesting possibilities to open up alliances with audit offices, ombudsmen, and so on. Also with parliamentarians, in an interesting dynamic, parliamentarians, after all, are supposed to be holding the executive to account. And some of the work that parliamentarians do in reviewing budgets already reflects some of the ideas that we are used to talking about in human rights law terms. And just earlier this week, we had the welcome news, I think, that the Northern Irish Assembly has decided to refer the Welfare Reform Bill in Northern Ireland, uh, which carries through on various... Uh, spending cuts introduced by the Conservative Liberal Democratic government at UK level to refer the Welfare Reform Bill to a special ad hoc committee to investigate its implications for equality and human rights. Uh, some would think uh, rather uncharted territory for the Northern Ireland Assembly, it has to be said. Uh, but analysis work may also be useful, and even though it's not primarily about courts, can feed into the work of litigation. And there are examples in uh, Latin America and elsewhere uh, of where courts have been less reluctant than Irish or indeed British courts to get involved in uh, trenching on government's prerogative in this area. There are challenges, of course. A key one is developing uh, relevant competences and skill set. One of my favorite moments during our project was when somebody sat down and tried to explain to uh, three of us who were lawyers how to calculate uh, and allow for inflation. Um, that produced quite a bit of mirth, uh, at least on the part of the trainer, not so much on our part. There are issues that we've already talked about uh, in relation to still trying to hone in on precise standards. Uh, and the requirements of human rights law. There are, of course, issues about transparency and accountability, participation and consultation. Quite often when we are doing our work, for instance, we were told by departments, well, we can't actually give you the information because we don't record informa uh, information on how resources are funneled through to particular groups like children and young people. Uh, so you can't do a particular analysis on funding for mental health services for children and young people. They just don't have the information. Sometimes it's even more surprising than that. I, I still can't quite get over the fact that when we asked uh, the Department for Social Development how much money do they spend on the housing benefit for people in the private rented sector, right? you would think that's a figure that's fairly easy to find. Yeah? Uh, but the answer for a very long time was that uh, they didn't actually know. I thought it was surprising. Eventually, we do now have some sort of estimates which reveals that the figure is likely in the ballpark of a quarter of a billion pounds. 
you know, which is quite a substantial portion of uh, government expenditure in that department and indeed in Northern Ireland. So there's work to be done on enhancing transparency, participation, accountability, and consultation. And I suppose I just also would like to flag up, particularly in light of the constitutional developments in the Republic of Ireland, that it may be desirable also to look not just at how do we improve uh, information flows, how do we improve participation, but are there ways in which the central institutions of representative government need to be reformed as well in order to ensure better realization of social and economic rights in the future. So, thank you.